Welcome to Country Fried Rock. I'm your host, Sloane Spencer. This week, we're talking with Will Johnson, continuing our series of conversations about our friend, Chris Porter, whose recent posthumous release of Don't Go Baby, It's Gonna Get Weird Without You, has just come out. Will Johnson produced both this album and Porter's previous album, This Red Mountain. You may know Johnson from some of his previous bands, including Centromatic and South San Gabriel, or maybe you know him from a few tours with the Drive-By Truckers. He tours solo these days and also is an accomplished visual artist, primarily of historic baseball figures. Really cool stuff. You should check it out. So thanks for being with us as we continue to honor the memory of our buddy, Chris Porter. Country Fried Rock is a podcast where I normally am interviewing people about their own albums, but obviously we've got special circumstances here. I appreciate all of y'all who were part of making this album happen, being willing to talk about coming together for the specific recording, but also I know that you and Chris had admiration for one another as well, the previous record and other things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a lot of red wine, a lot of red wine and a lot of (laughs) box wine and giggles. (laughs) That is the truth. I've never met you before, but I have mistakenly met you. I ran up to you in a venue one time thinking you were Porter, you were seated and I went up behind you and I gave a big hug and I was like Porter buddy and I was like oh my god I'm so sorry. When I you turned around I realized it was the wrong person and I told him that story so I apologize for being an idiot. This was That is going to go in the folder from 1995 when my old band was playing with the old 97s at this place. Brett Miller and I we were in a real similar look phase, like our hair was about the same length and we had the same style of glasses. Of course, he's a little taller than me, but nonetheless, and way better looking. But this girl came up to me and she was pretty hammered. And the old 97th had just played and my band was about to go on. And I'm carrying my kick drum and she comes up and she goes, she said, hey, I think your songs are awesome. I really love the band. It's a great show. And I said, we haven't played yet. And she goes, just take the fucking compliment, Rhett. <laughs> <laughs> and ran off. And so uh, she was just appalled, you know? She's like, God, oh, what an asshole. So I saw Red a little later, and I was like, hey, man, I'd, this was inadvertent, but there may be this girl that's kind of bummed on you, you know, for no real good reason. She just didn't want to hang out and listen to the explanation. But, and then I explained the story, <laughs> and of course he laughed about it, but. <laughs> that's hysterical. I'm going to put the Porter story in, <laughs> in that one. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I've asked you to chat with me today about Chris Porter's final album with Porter and the Blue Bonnet Rattlesnakes that was just released. Don't go, baby. It's going to get weird without you. But you have worked together over the years. We worked together on this Red Mountain toward the end of 13, I want to say. Other than Britton Bisonhurst, engineering is a different crew of musicians. Both sessions were short and to the point and very productive, kind of breakneck speed, you know, <laughs> but both the common denominator, as with a lot in Porter's world, as I came to discover, you know, because we were kind of new friends. We had only become friends, I want to say, in the fall of 2013 or so. We knew of each other, and I think we had a lot of mutual friends, and we'd probably met along the line, but only in the fall of 13 did we really start having regular communication and discussing in detail what we wanted to do with this Red Mountain, Mm -hmm. I started making a lot of notes. We started meeting for tacos and beers and talking that all over. And only at that point did we become, you know, we really got to know each other over that time. But I will say the common denominator, you know, that unified both sessions was that each one was, um, and I feel like a broken record, but each session was absolutely joyous, you know? And I know, Mm -hmm. I feel like if I had to use one word to describe recording with him and with both of those groups of people, you know, in those certain parts of our lives, it was a real, they were really joyous experiences. And not every session is that way. Sometimes they're like puzzles that just don't work together, or (laughs) maybe it works together, but it takes a few days to figure out how to make all the components compatible and, and what the strengths and weaknesses are and all that. There was never an element of that energy in either one of those sessions, either Don't Go Baby or or This Red Mountain, um, that I almost took it for granted. You know, like the the I do remember standing up at one point toward the end of the This Red Mountain session. And of course we had the Mastersons on that session and, and Bonnie Whitmore on bass and John D. Graham was in there playing a steel part and all of them were in there. I guess all five of them were all five of them were in there running over a song. And I do remember standing up in the control room, just talking to him over the talkback mic, saying, 
I feel like I'm managing like the 1927 Yankees here. Like there's so much, <laughs> there's so much talent in the, in, in the live room right now. And it sounds so good. I don't feel like I have to say or do a thing. It just sounds great. You guys keep doing your thing, you know? <laughs> so, Like I said, it's not every session you feel that way. And it, it became such a common theme and a common energy in both of those sessions that I almost took it for granted. But I think that speaks to his, his accuracy in choosing his musicians, but I also think it speaks to his talent and his trust that he had in his musicians and the, the dynamics that he already had going on with, with his friends that he played with. He trusted people for a reason. You know, I think he chose his friends carefully, but I think, I don't know, I think it, there was nothing reckless or careless in the assembly of those groups of people. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew that how good they all were, and he was right. I mean, each of those sessions came out wonderful, and they were different in their ways. He was definitely going through different stuff during the second one than he was the first one, and personally, I was too. I was in a really rotten place during this Red Mountain, um, personally, and I almost thought about not taking the session on not because I didn't want to. I wanted to. I just wasn't sure that I was going to be able to give myself over to the record like I wanted to because, you know, to be completely honest, my mother was uh, and she was nearing, you know, the last month of her life at the time. And she was really ill. She had taken a turn for the worse. Mm. And so I was kind of a wreck when we went in for this Red Mountain. But I decided, you know, I love these people so much. This might be exactly the burst of energy that I kind of need at this point. And it was one of the beacons that kind of helped get me through a real, real nasty, like the toughest time of my life. Yeah. And I feel like I told him that, but I'm, you know, I probably said it in passing, you know, but uh, I, you know, I hope he understood how important that session wound up being to me after all. Yeah. That's a long-winded answer, but both sessions were extremely joyous, you know? Yeah. I, I can't speak for what anyone else would think, but he really did have a gift for seeing you for two seconds and picking up on exactly what's been going on with you since the last time you saw one another. That's exactly right. It's a cliche, I suppose, but no water passed with him. I mean, we could hang out two weeks later for beers or something, and or it'd be three months later. Mm -hmm. because we were ships in the night in a lot of ways. He was always on the road, and I'm often on the road, so it wasn't that easy. Uh, but anytime we did get together, even if it had been, I don't know, six or eight months, he's the kind of friend that he just locks right, you know, he just locked right back in where you left off. Every time. Okay, cool. How much time <laughs> we got here? We got about, what we got, about an hour and a half, two and a half hours. That's about two, three beers. Let's sit for a while. What? Okay, <laughs> tell me what's been going on. You know, tell me about the West. Tell me about Europe. Tell me about this new record. Exactly. And, uh, nothing got dusty in the room of that friendship at all. It was always active and always vibrant and positive and it was always just a hang that I always look forward to. I'm just sitting here kind of smiling and you know honestly I wasn't sure about interviewing everybody for all this because I was like do I really want to talk about all this every time but really it's like every happy memory and you think of just the silly stuff and everyone says the same thing we all had these very positive friendships that picked up and dropped off and picked right back up again as if it hadn't been any gap of time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, you know, it, musicians have to deal with that a lot because we're all, a lot of us are ships in the night. And there's a lot of time that passes that we don't see each other. And sometimes that's not always the case. You don't always lock right back in or uh, the time can create distance, unfortunately. And I understand that. I mean, that's just the way some people are wired, but it wasn't the way he was wired. Mm -hmm. He was wired like a family member. Yes. Of so many of so many of his friends. He was wired like a sibling that would just lock right back in with you right across the table. Like, okay, tell me about this new record, man. Who are you going to do it with? What's, what's the deal, you know? <laughs> and that was a word he used a lot to describe people. You know, he would describe very specific people as family. Yeah. Often. And I grew to trust him. I grew to trust him. I grew to trust his word. If I had questions about records or musicians or bands or anything like that. I mean, he was a very thorough listener and a very generous, mm -hmm. extremely generous soul too. There would be times where he'd show up with a record or two and say, like, hey man, I bought these a few weeks ago. I like them okay, but honestly, I think they'd be more up your alley. I think you'll like them more. And that's just, <laughs> that was natural for him. And a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, it's not that way, but generosity came to him very naturally. 
Absolutely. I mean, I have an ongoing commitment to a musician's mental health care charity that I've worked with for a really long time. And every time I've done any kind of event or a charity compilation, he was always the very first person saying, let me give you a song. What can I do? You're going to do an event. Let's make this happen. Yeah. Um, and in fact, one of your bands, Centromatic, has donated a song for one of them as well. And thank you for that. Cool. Um, yes. But it, but point being, I hadn't even announced it yet. And he like the word had like just trickled out and he's calling me up going, Hey, so which one do you want? Do you want me to re-record that? How are we going to do this? Yeah, <laughs> I'm like awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. I mean, his you know his communication and his willingness and his uh, his presence was just unwavering. He was also an incredibly prolific songwriter. He had albums worth of stuff that he wanted to record and didn't record, and yeah, uh, you know, would say he was going to record and then would reevaluate the project and move on and I know there was a stretch between this Red Mountain and this album where he thought maybe there was going to be another record for a while. Yeah. The the details didn't come through and he and I had actually had talked about that for a, for a program that I never aired because he called me back and he said, "Hey, I'm going to do something totally different. Let's just pretend that never happened." <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so that's what we did. <laughs> the reason I say that is he wrote so prolifically and Every project kind of had its own take. And sonically, you're the connection other than Porter on from this Red Mountain to this one because because the players were so different and the sound is different. Yeah, I mean, each record was recorded in the same place and it was mixed by the same guys, mixed by Britton Bisonhurst and engineered by him. But from a producer standpoint, and I use that term so loosely, the term producer to me just feels so antiquated, but... um. We all produce the record, you know, um, from a producer standpoint, I was definitely, I wasn't drawing a line in the sand necessarily, but I was very much rooting to do another, another at Britain's place with at least Britain and me back in line. And then, you know, see, see what musicians wants to pick. I, I work extremely well with Britain. We're a good team. He's one of my best friends. And I think that Porter was so happy with the experience from this Red Mountain that it felt like, I don't ever remember there being discussed like doing it anywhere else. It felt like a no brainer. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I think Porter and Britain had conversations about Don't Go Baby before, not long after this Red Mountain was over. Like it would be a few months and then they'd start talking. So it, it never felt like it was in question. Now, aside from that, the Mastersons did come in and play on one song at the very end of the session for Don't Go Baby. But otherwise, Porter was really, you know, he knew he wanted Shauna on the record and he knew he wanted John Calvin. And at first he asked me to drum on it. And I was a little bit on the fence because I I was worried that that was going to split my brain a little bit too far out to, I don't know, I was worried I was going to be spread a little too thin during the session and concentrating on writing and tracking drum parts, but also trying to produce but the more I got to understand the songs and the more that Porter and I met and talked about it, just as he's want to do, he talk you down from your tree and let you know, like, it's going to be <laughs> cool, man. It's going to be all right. Don't you worry about it. I trust you. And I said, okay, cool, because I'm not sure I trust me. But if you trust me, I guess that's a good sign. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he asked me to drum on it. And the more I thought about it, I admire John Calvin and Shauna so much. And Shauna and I have spent a lot of road time together from the days of the truckers and Centromatic, and we've played a lot of music together. Mm -hmm. We'd never played together in a rhythm section capacity, which, oh, yeah, we'd always, you know, played together and with me on guitar and the truckers, or I think she even played some bass with Centromatic a time or two, but context of a rhythm section, we had never tracked or played live or anything. And so the more I thought about that, the more appealing that became to me and I thought well you know that's good and I I knew Porter was definitely you know naturally he just he wanted to to make things as inexpensive as he could and so maybe a two for one drum van producing is fine <laughs> but the more I thought about it I was like man this is great this is going to be really good actually you were right all along because we all should be sitting in the room working on these songs together you know I think he just trusted you know he trusted me as a drummer even though he hadn't played with me before and that meant a ton to me that was a huge endorsement and so i don't know the more i thought about it the more appealing the idea became to me and i thought man with the personalities of porter and john calvin and shauna and me all together why not man let's give it a shot i think we'll make for a a good rock band with this particular collection of songs which happened to be pretty rock you know 
Yeah. It was like, ah, oh, yes, Porter's making this rock record. We've talked about this. Yeah. This is cool. I mean, Chris Masterson and I were speaking about it on Saturday night. And, and I mean, obviously, it's a bittersweet occasion with the release of this thing. And, you know, it was hard. It was hard yeah. for a few days last week just knowing that we're, we were nearing the year, mm-hmm. you know, the year anniversary of his passing. and But also there's this joyous thing that this record is finally coming out. And Chris and I both agreed at the end of the conversation. It's like, you know, and you can, if you can kind of push the sadness away and just back away from it and listen to it and try to listen to the record without those connotations, it's a pretty fun rock record. It's a really cool, like, it is. We managed to get a really cool rock record out of it that's, that's fun, you know? I was listening to it some this morning on the way to the grocery store and I, I don't know, I just listened to War Paint. Stone in Traffic and all. It's like, that's oh, a fun rock record. I love that song. It's just a cool, fun <laughs> rock record, you know, in a lot of places. He definitely had a vision for what he wanted to have happen. So how did that... I, I'm, I'm curious, knowing him as a friend, and <laughs> how could you produce, really, with Porter? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, <laughs> I mean that respectfully. You know what I'm saying. Without a doubt. And I mean... Uh, I'm not the type of producer that's going to come in and roll up my shirt sleeves and pace around the room and tinker with every component. You know, I mean, I think the record is supposed to have everybody's fingerprints all over it. And what those fingerprints wind up being, well, I think that gets determined over the course of the first few songs, really, Mm. that are recorded. I think that's when the, the guts of the personality of the whole thing and the foundation of the whole thing are literally laid down. And so you got to let the musicians speak to really get a definition of what the session and what the record is going to be. That's part of the beauty of going in and making records because, you know, you can put an object in your hand and squeeze it super tight and then you can loosen up a little bit and that object's still going to be there. And I think that's the way that you have to treat a recording process because like, I can't recall a record that came out at the end exactly like I thought it was going to be the first day that we loaded into the studio. And I think Porter was always open to that possibility as well. It's not to suggest that he didn't have strong ideas, because of course he did, as you said. He was very determined and he was a very... He had a clear vision of what he wanted the songs to be, but when it came to some of the... uh, some of the atmosphere and some of the overdubs and things like that, Mm -hmm. usually his comment was always... I mean, I I can remember him saying this to me 10 times over the course of both sessions. You know, I would express to him an idea and what, let's try this or Britain would do the same. And, you know, his response was consistently, cool, let's get weird. Cool, let's get weird. That was it. I love that. <laughs> and I always laughed about that, but that was Porter's way of letting you know that he trusted you. And that's mm-hmm. the reason you were there in the first place. He trusts his friends. He loved his friends. He trusted them to the end. And that's why he wanted you there in the first place. Mm-hmm. So as funny as cool, let's get weird was to me, it rang loudly over the course of years. Mm. That was him telling you that he loved you and he trusted you. So how was the release party in Austin this last weekend? It was fun. It was really fun. My wife and I went, and we couldn't stay till the very, very end because our nighttime child care witching hour <laughs> came around, and we had to pick our daughter up. But, man, it was so wonderful. I, everybody sounded superb, and the mood was good. That's nice. Respectful crowd, a good crowd, a really good crowd. But it was, you know, a lot of good covers of his songs, uh, and then people playing their own songs, too. But it was I can't imagine being anywhere else yeah. that night. There's, you know, I was just so grateful that I got back from tour in time to at least make the show. Exactly, exactly. And there's another one coming up November 4th in Birmingham at the Syndicate Lounge. Uh, that's what I understand, yeah. When he first moved to Texas, I was like, you moved to Texas, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it fit him. It fit him so well, and I was so surprised, except that it was so natural and just... It was natural. I think he, you know, I don't... I'm sure he probably had a couple, you know, everybody has their stretches of like, oh, what have I done? I'm uncertain. What is this place? But I don't recall him voicing that to me. I always recall him being pretty down with the Austin thing. I think it was a pretty natural move for him. And he sure didn't have any trouble making friends or anything like that. To me, it felt about as seamless as could be. 
his parents were at the show the other night, which just took the whole thing over the. Oh man! That took the whole thing over the top for me. It was so good to see them and hug their necks and talk with them for a little bit. Oh. I was already in a in about a as joyous a way as I could have been just to you know be able to go to the show and see everybody, but uh, to see his folks that just that took it over the top for me. That was tremendous. The very first time I interviewed him, so back in 2010, I guess, he was still in the back row Baptist, and he was always so sweet and thoughtful about his mom and dad and said, you know, I'm a very different person, but they love me. Yeah. <laughs> Just always, always. Well, Andrea had told me about their greatness, you know. Andrea had, she had definitely, like, informed me of how sweet and how cool they they are. But uh, when I mm-hmm. when I was passing through Birmingham on a tour back in February, I had a short drive the next day, so I reached out and we got in touch and sat down and had lunch together and to sit there with them for an hour, hour and a half, you know, and we, you know, tell you the truth, we didn't talk a ton about Chris. I didn't, I don't know, I just wanted to let the conversation be what it was. And so we, there's a lot of life discussion and a lot of life and kids and travel and Alabama and Texas and, you know, and it was so, it was such a cool thing to sit there with them for a little while and at the very end I did I did ask them I was like have you heard the record yet and they said no I said okay well hang tight you know like (laughs) this is a slightly unusual thing but we went across the way to the Walmart into the belly of the beast went back to the tech section and the entertainment session and got a stack of CDRs and I burned them a CD out of the back of my car I was like I know this is really informal and all but I'll make you a CD if you'd like one you know but if you don't want to hear it if you'd rather wait for it to come out certainly understandable. I don't want to, don't feel pressured. And they said, you know, like, yeah, of course, we'd love to hear it. So we all went in there and got CDRs and waited in line and <laughs> walked out and I burned them a CD <laughs> and gave them the record. And uh, just because, I don't know, I was, if you haven't heard it yet, I do think, I think you would love it. I think that you'd be very proud. And so uh, anyway, it was a funny experience, but I knew by that point that I loved and trusted them enough that they'd probably be pretty cool with it. So I didn't feel weird asking them at the end of the right. at the end of the visit. You know, like you get a pretty good feel for their personalities and their kindness and even humor and all that stuff. So we walked walked across the way and got some CDRs and burned off a copy of Don't Go Baby. <laughs> I was like, y'all are family to me, man. Y'all are family to me now. If we're doing this kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> I'll see y'all next visit. <laughs> That's right. What's for Thanksgiving? Chaotic Walmart parking lot. <laughs> I knew Porter would have laughed about that one. That's just, oh, man, he would love this. You bet. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's the best. <laughs> Well, I'm so appreciative of your time to talk with us about Porter. And, you know, obviously, he never met a stranger, but he left friends and family everywhere who all just love him dearly and are so glad we all we all got to finally hear the record. It's so good. And it's so much fun. And yeah, it's been so much fun to talk about him because he was a fun guy. Oh, my God. There's so many good stories. I mean, there's just, you know, his humor and his smile and his laughter, everything. I mean, I've, I've said it several times i wrote it in an instagram post two days ago it's fun. i think i'll hear his laugh for the rest of my life you know it's musical to me and even though you know we didn't get to know each other until pretty well later on we only got three years of really good friendship out of this life i never once felt like this was a new acquaintance i felt like this is a new good friend and we lock in and we connect we've got a lot of stories to share and he's He's a ray of, he, man, I met him at a time when I needed a, a new ray of positivity and friendship in my life, and I'm really grateful for the timing of that. I was a new friend to him, but I felt like we were pretty good friends. I felt like we had a lot, lot in common, a lot, lot, lot of good connections that I'll always be grateful for. Again, Will, I really, really appreciate your wonderful conversation about him and about the record, and thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me along. I really appreciate it. It's fun. Thank you. Safe travels. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Production assistance for this program provided by Jeffrey Salter. Thanks so much for hanging out with us here at Country Fried Rock. Find more of our episodes wherever your favorite podcast is or at countryfriedrock.org. All content is copyright 2017 by Lilypad Productions. All rights reserved. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are Country Fried Rock. If you need to reach out in the United States for 24-7 assistance, call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. 800 273 
555. They also have 24-7 chat available at suicidepreventionlifeline.org. I've been making bracelets from used guitar strings that musician friends have been sending me and adding a little medallion on there with that Suicide Prevention Lifeline phone number on it. Giving them to a bunch of musicians over the last few months. They're all different. If you'd like one, shoot me a DM on either Twitter or Insta. They're $15, including shipping. Take care, and thanks so much for taking care of the people you love. Ever he been helping us some country fried? Fried.